Today I'd like to talk about the difference between acute and chronic infections. Modern medicine is excellent at dealing with acute infections, not so much with chronic. I'd like to talk about how that happened and what we can do about it. Before the era of antibiotics, cholera, diphtheria, plague, these are real killers. A person could be dead in a week. In the 1800s, a brilliant scientist and doctor named Koch laid the foundations for modern microbiology. What he said was, take a sample in a test tube of a fluid from a sick person. Transfer it to a petri dish that has some growth media. Grow the bacteria. Inject it back into a healthy subject, and if the same disease shows up, now you know it's causing the disease. All that's left to do is take that bacteria, grow it on a lot of petri dishes, and then put different substances on it and see what might kill it. Well, that's how antibiotics came about. But inadvertently, we ended up missing a whole class of infections as a result of this technique. Let me explain what happened. It works great for the acute bacteria, but chronic disease-causing bacteria, it doesn't work well with at all. They're social. They like to form slimy communities that stick to things. So if you take fluid from a sick person who is infected with a chronic uh, bacteria, then it will stick to the side of the test tube when you pour it into the Petri dish. And if you do get some onto the Petri dish, they have an entirely different kind of food they like to eat, so you can't grow them very well. It wasn't until quite recently with the invention of confocal scanning laser microscopes we could even see the slime layers that these things are growing in. They're called biofilms. Most chronic diseases are associated with biofilms. If we're going to learn how to deal with chronic diseases, chronic infections, we need to start paying attention to this new class of bacteria and how they grow. Okay, let's talk about how they grow. Like I said, they're social. They like to form layers. If you've ever seen the slime layer on top of a compost pile, that's a biofilm infection, or biofilm. It's an infection when it gets in us. So in order to understand how to go after them, let's get to know them a little bit better. Biofilms are not haphazard communities. They're actually quite complex. They have the ability to store water and nutrients, which means fasting isn't going to do much for us because they have enough water and food to survive quite some time. They have little appendages called pili that they use to attach to each other and to grab onto us with when they get in our bodies. And they can beat them in unison to regulate their temperature, so a fever won't do much against them. They are virtually immune to our immune system. The white blood cells of our immune system, when they uh, try to get into a biofilm, they'll get uh, a few microns in and then they get stuck and that's it. They're also uh, nearly impervious to antibiotics. A bacteria that's free-floating, uh, diphtheria, cholera, you can get it with an antibiotic. But the chronic ones, well, a infection that's in a biofilm has upwards of a 5,000 time uh, degree of protection against anti an antibiotic. What that means is you would need 5,000 times more antibiotics to get to it in a biofilm than if the biofilm wasn't there. Another thing is they have what are called sleeper or persister cells. 1% of the uh, bacteria in a biofilm at any point in time are dormant, they're sleeping. So they, even if you overwhelm them with antibiotics, those particular bacteria aren't metabolically active. They're not eating, they're not reproducing, and that's when the antibiotics can get into the bacteria and kill them. So even if you were to wipe out 99% of the metabolically active bacteria, when the antibiotics stop, that last 1% wakes up, and in a day or two, they repopulate it again. Finally, they're smart. Uh, they have nanowires that they send throughout their slime layer, and functionally, it's like a slimy microbial brain. And what that means is they can adapt. Uh, it's almost a rudimentary form of intelligence. So 
if we're going to deal with biofilms, we need to address uh, several aspects of it. The first thing we want to do is we want to dissolve the biofilm so the body can get into it. The second thing we want to do is we want to interrupt its intelligence so it can't adapt so quickly to what we're doing. And then the last thing is we need a way to deal with the persister cells so that whatever it is that we do, once we stop, they don't come back. And let's talk about each of those now. To dissolve a biofilm, you can use an oxidizer, a solvent, or an enzyme. Oxidizers would be things like ozone and hydrogen peroxide, but not everyone has an ozone machine or access to a hydrogen peroxide IV. Solvents would include things like DMSO and essential oils. And then the enzymes would be things like serapeptase, which is the enzyme that silkworms use to dissolve out of their chrysalis. Okay, that gets us through the biofilm. Now, our own immune system can start working. But we want to confuse it because it is intelligent in a way. The way that biofilm bacteria communicate with one another is called quorum sensing. And you can interfere with quorum sensing with bitter compounds. Things like berberine, uh, gentian, will interfere with the quorum sensing of these bacteria. So that robs it of its intelligence. And then finally, we need some kind of maintenance protocol. So whatever it is that we do can't have side effects because we are going to have to be on it to some degree for quite some time until the last of the persister cells go, and that could be months. Okay, what can we actually use then? What's a good protocol? Again, if you have access to hydrogen peroxide IVs and ozone, that's great. If not, I would suggest essential oils. Things like oregano oil, thyme, pinenes from pine resin. These are all excellent ways at getting into biofilm infections. Clove also works. Uh, in terms of the enzymes, again, serapeptase. And we make two products that you might consider. The Zoivin is designed to supply both the essential oils and the bitters that you could use in a biofilm protocol. Our Notoplex product contains serapeptase in suppository form. We place it in a suppository because it's estimated that only 5% of serapeptase taken orally survives digestion, whereas up to 95% of serapeptase in a suppository is absorbed. Then, finally, you're going to need some kind of maintenance. Fortunately, if you use something that's non-toxic, then all you have to do is just lower the amount. So instead of taking uh, more heroic doses that you might need in the beginning, you could do something like there's a little bit every few days. Personally, I'll take a little bit of zoibin just on the tip of my tongue, and maybe once a week I'll do some serapeptase. And what I find is that keeps the biofilms at bay, and my health is really improved from it.